144%. Well, that's a big number. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for our Thought Leadership Workshop on Latin America. My name is Aurel Delgado. I am the Digital Marketing Director for America's Market Intelligence. And way back in October of 2016, I kicked off Thought Leadership for AMI in our company. So when we first started it, within the first month, we saw an increase in web traffic of 144%. So that's what this number actually means. So Thought Leadership it started producing for us almost immediately and we saw it also produce results with this uh, for us over uh, the long haul over the past four years. So let's take a look at some of those numbers. When we sat down to calculate it recently, we looked at it from the standpoint of uh, uh, a compound annual growth rate. So from that standpoint, we saw a big jump in web traffic. We also saw a big jump in terms of uh, the monthly leads that are coming in and also new business in general. So we saw, saw a lot of good results in that, in that aspect. And so we're not really a thought leadership or content marketing agency or anything like that. Our, our business is market intelligence. What we provide normally for companies would be studies very specific data and analysis to help companies be successful in Latin America in a variety of sectors, such as payments and also mining, energy, healthcare. And so what happened, our thought leadership ended up being so successful that companies actually came to us for thought leadership services as well. And that's kind of what has inspired the workshop here today, because in talking and working with companies, we saw that there were some sort of knowledge gaps that we could fill. And that's why we put together this workshop. There's challenges that companies are facing. So one of the challenges is that the companies have a lot of good uh, subject matter experts who really know an area, but they don't know how to translate that into thought leadership content that's effective. Another challenge that companies face is between strategy and execution. Some companies really have good ideas for their strategy, but not the execution and vice versa. That's why in today's workshop, we're gonna be focusing on thought leadership, strategy and execution, the 30,000 foot view to plan everything out. And then the granular execution with the little tips of how to execute thought leadership content most effectively. So let's keep moving on to our legal notice here. Now, what this basically says is that we expect you to use uh, the information provided in today's workshop along with in, uh, sources, uh, other sources besides us, and to use that in combination with sound management practices. For that reason, we will not assume responsibility for commercial loss due to business decisions made uh, from information that was shared here today with you. So let's take a look at our speakers and know who's gonna be talking to us today. Uh, I'm doing sort of this introductory portion, but really to kick us off, we're gonna have John Price start us off. He is the managing director of AMI and a recognized thought leader for Latin America in his own right. You may be familiar with uh, his uh, talks at different trade shows or uh, his blog posts and webinars and, and such. So we're also gonna have Lindsay Lear speaking. She is the director of our payments practice. And she is a thought leadership in the pay, uh, thought leader in the uh, payment space for Latin America as well. And she's also spearheaded a number of different projects of thought leadership for payments companies. So she's going to be able to contribute quite a bit. And then I'll chime in here and there to talk about execution and things like that. Things that you can do to make your thought leadership smoother and better, hopefully. And that'll be sort of uh, the speaker list. Now, what are we going to talk about today in the structure, the agenda? Well, it's gonna be about 50 minutes or so of presentation. That's how we're gonna structure it. And then about 10 minutes or so for questions. You don't have to wait until the end of the event to ask us questions, or you can ask us questions at any point in time. The way to do it is basically, you would just look at your screen at the bottom, you should have sort of a black band, so to speak, with a number of icons. One of them is Q&A. You click on that, it brings up a window. You can type your question in the window and send it to us. So as we're going along and questions occur to you, by all means, fire away, and we'll answer them at the end of the event. Now, here's a look at what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about thought leadership, the benefits, its applicability for Latin America. Then we're gonna get into strategy, how to develop the best and most effective strategy. Then we're going to get into the granular portion, execution, how to best execute different types of thought leadership content, such as blogs and webinars and such. And then we're gonna talk about how to market that content so people are aware of what's going on. So there's gonna be a lot of information covered here today and you're gonna be tempted to take notes and by all means you can do that. However, one thing we want to mention is that we've developed a special manual for everyone who is registered for this webinar. Within 24 to 48 hours, we're going to send it out to you. And that's going to cover a lot of what we've talked about here today in the webinar and maybe more. So you don't necessarily have to go crazy taking notes because you're going to have that resource arriving in your inbox and you'll be able to refer to that. Now, I think that pretty much does it for the preliminaries. I'm going to turn the floor over to John Price. He's going to talk to you a little bit about what thought leadership is. But before he does that, let's clear up what thought leadership is not. Hello. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome again. I'm pleased to be here. Um, and and as, as Abel uh, points out, we do need to begin by defining what is thought leadership. And to do so, I'd like us to just step back for a moment and look at the wider picture, the arc of history of what brought us here. Not that long ago, uh, marketers relied on advertising, and it was all driven by delivering to you compelling um, media in the form of television, in the form of uh, radio and print. And by having your captivated attention, they would oblige you to watch their advertising. And advertisers used methods that were really all about them. Um, what was about their product, what was best about their product, and how it beat the competition. And, and on the next slide, you're going to see that, uh, that advertising is, in fact, not the only marketing tool out there. If we fast forward to today, we know that both consumers and business audiences spend a lot more time on devices than they do watching television, and much more than they do uh, listening to the radio or looking at print. So how do marketers have to adapt themselves in this in new environment? We also know that customers are a lot more skeptical about any messaging that sounds self-aggrandizing. Um, they are, we are so overwhelmed by messaging, we turn off when we hear a message that is uh, self-promotional. Instead, marketers rely more and more on the testimonials of others to tell you how great it is. And there you see the role of influencers and others. But to grab people's attention today, marketers need to either entertain or inform and solve problems for their audience. And there are two new areas that have emerged in recent years that are unique one from the other, but often are combined when people think about new marketing techniques. And I speak of content marketing and thought leadership. Content marketing is really a B to C tactic. And a great example of that is Red Bull's online magazine, which is really about chronicling um, the excitement of extreme sports with uh, compelling articles, compelling images. And so Red Bull has managed to position its brand as being closely associated with extreme sports. So if you're thinking of rock climbing or parachuting or kite surfing, you think of Red Bull. Thought leadership, by contrast, is really a B2B tool. And it exists because people have a need. They have an information need, and you are solving a problem for them by delivering content that informs them in an, in an area or a specific um, field where there's a shortage of information, particularly free information. And it's important because it positions you as a expert is a subject matter expert on something. So when people think that field, they go to content that you have authored. And so it has great shelf life as a result. Now let's look at a couple of examples of effective thought leadership campaigns that we've seen in recent years. You're probably familiar with the World Economic Forum. And if not, you've certainly heard of the famous or infamous Davos conference that goes on um, around this time of year in the winter in Switzerland when heads of state and business leaders from around the world meet. Well, that conference is actually on the World Economic Forum is a private company and it is a considered the most prestigious um, meeting uh, organized by anyone worldwide. And Davos has other meetings, six or seven other meetings, regional meetings around the world. And this is how they make their money, but how they position themselves as experts that make their events irrefutably the most prestigious of their kind is the global competitiveness report that they put out. They spend millions putting together and they rank very precisely the competitiveness um, features of different countries and countries await uh, jealously for this information to be published. And they give this information out freely around the world and they distribute it widely. And it's that report that positions the, the World Economic Forum the way it does. Another great example is Amex. Amex, one of the most important um, customer segments for Amex is small business. And what they do is they've, uh, going back quite several years now, they began a, a product called Open Forum, which now is called Business Class 
where they provide um, sort of best practices instruction for small business owners on things like marketing, finance, accounting. And it becomes a repertoire of information, of reference that you can go back to on a frequent basis to, as well as it's updated as regulations change and things like that. Um, and so as a reference, people continue to go back to it and obviously see the Amex brand every time they do. Our ourselves at AMI have experimented with several different um, thought leadership techniques. Um, you may have attended our webinars in the past. We certainly publish a lot of articles. We speak at public events as well as private events. These are all forms of thought leadership. And when, when the COVID lockdowns began, one of the most important complaints that um, our customers and stakeholders had within each of our industry practices was that they could no longer attend conferences because those conferences beyond what's billed as the content being presented are very important um, areas to pick up industry gossip for lack of, a, lack of a better word, to stay in tune with what's going on in your industry, those conversations with people in your industry. So we developed a very informal product um, in the form of a weekly coffee chat that's now morphed into a monthly coffee chat where we invite guests or we speak ourselves, but we get people speaking from within the community of an industry, uh, asking questions and, and, and meeting one another. And this has become an interesting tool for us to stay in tune with, with the industries within our practices. Now, um, Let's review some of the benefits that thought leadership provides. Certainly one of them is that you control the message. Uh, although it's not a message about promoting yourself, you are nonetheless building a message that is captivating to your audience. When we compare thought leadership techniques to others, we know that it's relatively low cost. Um, in some cases, um, a, a small fraction of what you would spend on advertising and delivering the same level of results. And what's nice is because of the digital landscape through which most thought leadership is delivered today, it's very easy to measure um, the output of that, whether it's leads or sales or eyeballs or um, brand awareness, et cetera. And probably the one of the most distinguishing features is because you're building reference material, it has shelf life, it has lasting value and people will come back to it on a regular basis. Now, the benefits of thought leadership are even more pronounced when we consider a region like Latin America. In Latin America, for those of you who operate in the region, you know there's a real dearth of basic information, whether it's sizing uh, your industry, sizing the demand of a particular product, understanding consumer behavior in, in your sector. These are all information uh, items that are often free or at a relatively low cost available in more developed markets. But for several reasons, there is a, it is a real information desert in Latin America. And some of those reasons are listed there. As a result, those who take the investment, who take the time to invest in creating original content that helps inform people about a particular uh, sector or issue or trend are going to uh, receive even a greater level of marketing impact because of the lack of comparative information that's out there. So now that we understand the compelling uh, value proposition of thought leadership in Latin America, let me hand it over to Lindsay Lear, the head of our uh, payments practice to get us started on building your next thought leadership campaign. Thank you, John. Thanks, Abel. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. It's great to see many familiar faces. Again, my name is Lindsay Lear. I lead our payments practice, and we have been committed to thought leadership over the past several years for marketing and building our own practice and on behalf of clients who want to get a particular message out there to their audience. So we have learned a lot about how to do thought leadership well. As you all know, there is loads of content out there and even more now that we're all in lockdown and really rely only on digital methods to communicate and, and to share information. So I wanna walk us through four basic principles that you need to get really solid before you embark on any thought leadership program or campaign to make sure that it's successful. And it's setting you apart from competitors and others who are out there putting out content. You wanna make sure that your brand is set apart and really recognized. So 
The first thing to really hone in on is original analysis. And I want to uh, emphasize the word original. There's so much fluff out there. Uh, and it's, it's really critical that your brand stands out with by providing information people have never heard before. The very first thing I do when I sit down to write an article or a white paper is think, what insights do I have that nobody else has? And every company in your industry has something unique that no one else sees or knows because of your particular position. And so really determining what that is, is crucial to deliver a, a unique message. A couple other ways to be original, be provocative, ask hard questions point out uh, deficiencies in conventional wisdom or a conventional narrative that's being told in your industry, debunk myths that are in your industry. This might push some people's buttons, but if it's based on uh, fact and sound research, you're able to uh, surprise people and, and stand out from the crowd of it. The next principle is to be solution oriented. And this is very important because of how time crunched everyone is. People don't have time to be leisurely reading information if it's not concretely solving one of their problems. Uh, one of our most popular articles ever written was entitled, Why Digital Wallets in Latin America Don't Work and How to Fix Them. So the title was very direct, it was a bit provocative, and most importantly, it spoke to a, very, a hot button topic in the industry that many industry players were struggling with. So we offered some solutions in this article and it still gets hits today, even though it was published in 2017 or 2018. Um, helping your clients solve their pain points will uh, co connect them to your brand, create loyalty and make them want to work with you. Uh, the third uh, principle to remember is to always make sure that your content is adding value. This is related to solutions. Um, but you want to you don't you want to avoid simply publishing information just to get your name out there or just to be present on the internet. Um, you need to make sure that what you're publishing, what you're communicating, is relevant to your clients and your readers and is adding value to them. Uh, as John mentioned, you know during the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had to think about what do our clients want from us right now? How can we help? How can we support? And so we developed the coffee chat series which was a space for people to come together and share insights. And that continued all throughout the year. Uh, and we really created a culture of adding value. Um, and it's important to remember that when we talk about thought leadership, we're, we're talking about a, a marketing investment, meaning we're offering this information and content out there for free. Um, it's an expense that we take on uh, in an effort to add value to the industry, add value to our clients, uh, knowing that that will come back to us in the form of partnership and work in the future. Uh, so this isn't a, a revenue generating activity. We're really adding value to our clients, um, giving them good faith in us, positioning our brand as expertise in a certain area, which, which uh, helps you earn credibility and uh, goodwill with your clients. And then fourth, this one is uh, easy to forget sometimes when you're very passionate about your content and uh, you're excited about what you're writing, what you're producing, it can be easy to forget to include a call to action. Uh, whatever content piece you're developing, you want to remind your readers how your content connects to your brand. Uh, why are you writing this? How is this relevant to your company? And what do you want them to do with the information? Are you trying to get them to visit your website? Do you want them to book an appointment with you, inquire about, about your services? Um, what specific action do you want them to take? So important to build that into the end of whatever format you're working with so your readers know how to engage with you. So some four key principles to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that... Once you have those principles really solid, you can then think about, okay, what do I do with my content? Uh, and it, you'd be very surprised at how many companies there are who are very good at coming up with excellent ideas and insights, but don't necessarily know what to do with it. And this can be forgotten. So on the next slide, we can see uh, several questions that you want to get really clear before you start your thought leadership program. Okay, these are more tactical and more nitty gritty and more related to distribution and marketing, but uh, important to get nailed down. So where will your content live? On your website, on a blog, on a landing page? How will readers find you? 
Who is your target audience? Who are the specific companies and job titles you want to consume your content and how will you get it into their hands? How are you gonna distribute it via email marketing? Uh, do you have a robust email list that will make that effective via social media, via partnerships? How will, what is the mechanism to get your information out there? And then most very important related to how you're measuring the success of your thought leadership. What do you expect to happen as a result? Are you looking for hard leads? Are you looking to position your brand in a certain light? Are you looking to re-engage with your audience? What are those metrics that you're looking for that will tell you your thought leadership campaign has been successful? If you don't have those in place, you end up spending a lot of investment and it may or may not be working for you. You have no way to know. So measuring that is really critical as well. All right, so at this point, um, once you kind of have these ideas clear for yourself, you're then ready to move into the actual content creation. And I'll turn it back to Abel to walk us through those steps. All right. Well, that was very ethereal. Um, we wanted to sort of get it a big bang kind of thing, sort of an explosion with that particular video, but I'm not sure that we got the timing just right. But it's, development is all about that, though. It's about creation. It's about that eureka moment. So when you get into content and thought leadership content, what the the, the you have a, a couple of different content formats that you can look at. So blog posts are a fundamental basic one because when you put that out online and you have correct search engine optimization tactics in place, people find you. And so you want people to find your content, not just when you first push it out the door, but also in six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. So blogs are very good in that uh, aspect. They're also very good because you can house different forms of content. You can have a blog post that has a video embedded into it or a link to a white paper or an infographic embedded into it. So it's very flexible. White papers, of course, are very good because they allow you to go a little bit further in terms of your explanation of topics. You can explore more, cover more, do more. Infographics allow you to break everything down from a numerical standpoint on the B2B side, that can be very interesting. Videos are very helpful to give you some dynamic uh, content that people are gonna uh, gravitate to visually. Uh, taking that further, you have webinars and case studies. Case studies allow you to show your success, the applicability of your product or services uh, for uh, your customers. So all of those are formats that you would think about, okay, which am I going to do? And a lot of it really depends on what your audience responds to, what you think is going to put your company in the best light, what you can distribute most easily and measure most easily to, so you can see the effects of thought leadership content. So after you get the format, you have to start thinking about topics. At that point with topics, we've observed a couple of areas that seem to be very good for topics to focus what you're going to write about or do a video about and so on. So market sizing and segmentation is very obvious. Companies and people in your industry wanna know about market segments, how big they are, if they're growing, if they're contracting and so on. All of that is extremely helpful. When you get into innovation, everyone wants to know what's next, what's gonna disrupt or change my industry, or what's gonna be the new exciting technology that's gonna make a difference in my industry. So if you write about that, you're gonna definitely get some attention. Customer behavior is fundamental. Everybody wants to know what customers are doing, what they might do, what they're thinking of doing. So if you can capture that with your content, again, you're gonna grab some attention. And finally, industry trends and forecasting. People wanna know what's gonna happen next. So these four topics are all really good uh, as a basis to start coming up with your ideas and focusing it around those particular areas. Then you wanna go a little further and you wanna to try to refine it somewhat. So in this case, I would say for more direct inspiration, you would look at industry publications in your industry. So uh, that's kind of redundant, but you, you get what I mean. Now, what you would do with an industry publication is not do what they're doing, do something different. You don't wanna echo them. Remember that they've already built an audience and you're trying to build a new audience. So you don't wanna do what they do because they already have the advantage of being known. What you wanna do instead is what they're not doing. Find the things that where their coverage is missing or lacking and fill those gaps. That's gonna make you stand out and bring people to you. The other way to get some good ideas that are more direct within the four topics that I mentioned earlier is talk to your customers. Do little surveys where you ask them about their pain points. What are the biggest challenges for them? What are the biggest difficulties for them? Solve those and then put that in a form of content, in a video, in an infographic. But if you solve their problems, you're going to get their attention when you let them know, hey, I've solved your problem. Take a look. 
that's going to bring you an audience. Sales can tell you what customers are thinking as well because they talk to them all the time. So they can tell you what things are bothering people and what things are, what uh, topics have people worried. And you can address that in your content. What else? Focus on finding. So what does this mean? Focus on finding basically is about search engine optimization once again. So the, the thing that I would suggest for a lot of people in doing this is from the very beginning, you wanna have your content developed thinking about how you're gonna be found on the internet, what you wanna be found for. In other words, write or develop content about what you wanna be found for and work with SEO people either in your company or who are consultants so they can tell you how to set up your titles and do different formatting things with your content so that it's more easily found. Those people can also work to make sure that your site uh, in general um, has a lot of authority for, from a Google standpoint, and that way your, your results will come up. And again, the reason for that is you, you don't want to just be found for your content now. You want your content to bring you new people two years from now. So SEO is fundamental for that. So you have to thread that in early on. All right, so that's sort of the basics here. Let's talk a little bit more about developing specific types of content. One of the more specific types, of course, that I mentioned earlier is blogs. So with blogs, one of the first things we want to start is what kind of a post are we going to have? They're called posts. They're essentially articles, right? So what's going to be our format? What are we going to write about? Because you can be very idiosyncratic or not. So for B2B especially, what we look to do is to have kind of a format kind of mapped out. A listicle is one of the favorite ones that I have. You basically list something. Six reasons to do this. Ten common digital marketing mistakes. You can enumerate myths. You can enumerate problems. You can enumerate solutions. The interesting thing about that is it allows you to focus your article so you know exactly what you're going to be writing about because you have an amount that's fixed and your audience also knows exactly what to expect from you. So that works very well as a way to, to uh, organize your blog content. Uh, listicles have been around since 2005, but they still work. So it's a good practice to, to try to do. Explanations. Those are the lifeblood of thought leadership. You know, you're, you're positioning yourself as an expert in an industry. You're sharing your knowledge. So the more that you can explain the how and the why of things, the more compelling your content is going to be, depending on the questions that you're answering. Obviously, you would, as you would take those steps that we talked about earlier of asking your customers what they want to know, well, then when you explain, then it's going to be that much more powerful. News analysis is related to that. Um, because that's also an explanation. It could be new regulations that could be affecting your industry and incoming presidential administration that could affect your industry. So when you talk about news analysis, that's another area where you can grab people's attention because obviously people are keeping up with news. So they'll pay attention to what you're saying if you can reach them just the right way. Now, the other forms that, that we're going to talk about here are a little bit more general. So the statistical roundup is what I call it. It's basically about going out to look at research that, that's about a particular topic and uniting it under sort of one title. So in this case, I offer the example of e-commerce uh, shoppers. You can find a lot of data about those people and just say these are trends, these are things that they're doing. And that's valuable information. People want to know what shoppers are doing in different areas so they can adjust their marketing. So that's an example of how you can do that sort of a statistical roundup, but you can apply that in a lot of different areas. No? And then, of course, we have our study roundup. The study roundup is basically taking a 25-page study, let's say, and condensing it into a 500-word summary. That's valuable in and of itself. The person who's reading this doesn't have to look at that long study. They can just read your uh, summary, and that's that. So these are all pretty solid content formats to explore in that area. Now, when you actually start to write it, breaking it up becomes very important. So let's look here over on the far left. We have a blog post here from AMI. The title of the actual story is Mercados Latinoamericanos en Crecimiento en 2019, okay? And then we break it down by each market that's growing. So here we have auriculares y audífonos, so there's your headline, and then you have the paragraph, and to the left, you have the photo. That breaks it up. That's much easier to read. You go from section to section. What happens a lot of times when people start writing, it even happened here at AMI, because everybody here the, at practice leaders were used to writing reports. They tend to write text, 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 all the way down, just an unbroken line of text. That is tiresome to read, especially in a region like Latin America, where more people um, access the internet using mobile devices. That's very difficult for your eyes. It makes your eyes tired. You want to break it up so you can continue to engage the reader and take them from one section to the other. 
The middle examples here on this slide show you another way to do that with infographics. You can have little illustrations that you plop in between your text um, and, and, and have uh, data that's associated with that, just some numbers that are thrown in there. And that also tells your story and it also finds a new way of getting people's attention. So they stop and look at that. Then finally on the far right, uh, we have what they call a pull quote. If you look at that text there, banks must invest and reinvest, da, 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 da. Okay, that's uh, the same text that's in the article. All we did was take that portion and make it bigger and give it a different color. But that makes it stand out. It breaks it up visually. It makes it easier for you to go from section to section and not uh, you know, be, uh, lose interest or get bored. So that's basically breaking it up. That's uh, the tip there in terms of that. Now, in terms of more general tips, uh, vary your post size when it comes to a blog. You want to have some that are very long and in-depth, 2,000 words, 3,000 words. That's perfectly fine. But you also want to have some that are you know, medium length, maybe 750 words, and sometimes very short, 125 words. You don't need to do them all uh, at the same size. Varying it up is better because you have different ways of engaging your audience that way. Don't steal shots. This is one of those little basic things, but what happens a lot of times is people get involved in putting together a blog. They know that they have to spend the money to find the shots, but don't feel like it, so they take them from other websites. Well, these days they have tracking software. They can find you. Your company could face legal action, so don't do it. Ah, now this photo. When you go to get your stock images, um, the key that you want to look for in terms of, of what you're trying to convey, especially if it's people, you want to show them engaging in action as if the camera person just happened to catch them in that action and it looks natural. When, uh, but on stock agencies, one of the things that they do have are photos of people looking directly at the camera with a big smile like this lady is, but no one does that in real life. And thought leadership is all about credibility. And this is a detail, but it is important. So your blog has to be credible. You have to be credible as a thought leader. So when that happens, you basically, your photos make a difference. So that's why you want to show photos that are a bit more authentic uh, and, and not go for these kind of sort of smiley shots. All right, well, I think this should cover us for blogs. So let's go into another form of content. I'm going to turn the floor over to Lindsay. And she's going to talk to us about another form of content called white papers. for covering blogs so uh, comprehensively. Uh, blog is the natural inroad to thought leadership. It's, it's one of the simpler, <clears throat> easiest things to, to accomplish. But sometimes uh, companies feel like they need a little bit more space to cover a topic a bit more in depth. White, we have done multiple white papers <clears throat> for AMI and for clients. They're highly popular in the payments industry but they work for any industry in which you want to share ongoing analysis, in-depth look at a certain topic or data. Uh, so let's look at some particular tips when developing white papers. Just like a blog, you need to keep in mind your reader who nowadays we know has a short attention span and doesn't have the time to sit through reading an entire document necessarily. So a key tip to developing a successful white paper is making it approachable and user-friendly by breaking it up into chapters. That way a reader can dip in, they can dip out, they don't have to read the whole thing to capture your main points. So just a couple strategies here. Something that we love to do uh, is to repurpose your blog posts. So you, know, you can think about it in advance, choose a topic and develop four or five blog posts around a central theme. Once you're done posting those on your blog, you can compile them all into a white paper, write an introduction that ties them all together. And now you have a long form piece that you can distribute. And you can even distribute it physically. And it's nice to send as a gift to clients. Now they have a physical asset with your brand on it that has insight and data that's adding value to them on a regular basis. A great way to position your brand and uh, be providing nuggets to your clients that will help them in their everyday operations. The next tip is to simply take a big topic and break it down into four or five trends or aspects, uh, angles that you're going to approach this topic with. Again, focusing on chapters so the reader can go right to the table of contents, see what's most interesting to them and jump to it. That makes your content approachable, digestible, and will have a higher impact in your audience. Another strategy that is really important, not only for white papers, for any uh, content form that you create, but especially for white papers that are longer form, is to uh, 
base your, your publication on research, on original research. Again, not echoing, not reusing desk research or information that's already out there, but something new and fresh and original that you went out and produced and are bringing to the market proactively. This is great for a white paper because it gives you the opportunity to break up the text using charts, graphs, and illustrations to, to convey your point. Uh, makes it, again, user-friendly, eye-catching, fun, and everyone knows that data is what drives decisions in many cases, and there is a shortage of data in almost every industry in Latin America. <clears throat> so if you can fill that gap in a using a format that's easy to understand and to digest, you will really be setting yourself apart from the competition. Okay, a couple just more adva ad advantages of using data in your thought leadership is that you automatically position your company as an expert or having a sophisticated understanding of the industry. You're being generous. Again, that adding value uh, aspect, making uh, companies look favorably upon your brand and your publication is more likely to be picked up by the media. Uh, the media loves numbers. And so the more numbers and, and reliable data you have in your report, the greater distribution you're going to get. Okay, so that's that's white papers. Uh, similar, uh, but a little bit different and also very popular is infographics. So we'll cover that next. We're all familiar with infographics. Uh, they are a fantastic way to uh, pack a heavy punch, right? A lot of data delivered instantly in one screen to your viewers. People love infographics, um, but they are tricky to develop. And if you've never developed one, you may not know this. Uh, you know, several years ago, clients started asking us to create infographics for them. I said, sure, why not? How hard can it be? Um, but when you sit down to write it, you actually realize it's quite tricky to make a successful, impactful infographic. So a couple of things just to keep in mind. You want to make sure that you're covering a concrete topic. Uh, it's difficult to convey abstract ideas via images in an infographic format. So you need data, you need numbers, you need concrete information. This is where I see a lot of companies making a mistake in number two here. The, the purpose of an infographic shouldn't be to bombard your reader with data. It should be to tell a story that is supported by the data. So making sure you have an op, you, you leave space to weave in the meaning behind the data that you're conveying, because without that meaning, your brand kind of disappears. So you need to be the voice and the storyteller behind the data making sure your, 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 your audience understands the meaning and the purpose of this data and helps them connect the dots. And from a visual standpoint, making sure you're blending artwork numbers to tell an attractive, make, make an attractive format that people can easily read. Um, a, you know, one of the most challenging parts of creating an infographic is um, figuring out how to vary the numbers and how to really uh, sequentially frame a, an infographic. I, I didn't know this and Abel had to coach us and teach us on how to successfully convey these numbers so that it's interesting because repeatedly uh, reporting percentages becomes boring after a while. So you need to vary the numbers between absolute numbers, as you can see the 29 million, six out of 10, and then percentages in, in graphic format. So just to keep in mind that varying the types of information that you include is really important. The final piece is that often infographics are usually in a JPEG format and sometimes they're very big, they're very complicated and they can be difficult to read on a computer screen, especially if they're in vertical format. So one thing we have found success doing, we really love this format actually, is creating what we call an infographic report. A short PDF, three to five pages usually, that breaks an infographic up into a couple of pages so that it is lighter to read it tells a story, it takes readers on a journey. And, and you also, you know, what we do at the end is it provides an opportunity to write a couple of paragraphs summing up the key findings or the implications of, of the data you're sharing and gives you a chance to showcase who you are, who your brand is and how they can get in touch with you. So just, a, you know, another way to be creative and according to your audience with some of these different formats. 
Okay, so we've talked a lot about written format. Of course, there are other ways to get information out there. So we will next touch on videos. All right, so video creation. Uh, let's go over a couple of basic tips to be able to put those together. Uh, the first one would be brevity, keep them short. Uh, I think these days our attention spans have kind of been ruined. We don't really stand it, uh, hang in there too long for most types of video content. We want people to get to the point whether we're looking at it on Instagram or some other form of media. So in B2B, you wanna keep it short as well. Uh, anywhere from 30 seconds up to five minutes is a good range to think about in that sense. Now, if you wanna to try to develop your content a little more differently and keep it short, talking about your customer's pain points could be a way to go. If you know what bothers them, and you have your solution, make your video about your solution. Now, your solution could be a multi-step kind of thing. Well, you don't have to have your video cover all the steps. You're, you can actually break it up into individual videos. Step one for this video, step two for this one. And that way you can build some continuity and people can go watch the series, so to speak. When you go to put it together, uh, you want to storyboard it. That's what they call that. So you basically plan out what you're going to have in your video visually and textually. What's going to be in this shot, the next one, the next one. Now, that sounds kind of involved and you can find a developer that can help you with that. But the reason you want to do that is because thought leadership is about credibility, as we were saying earlier. So better production is more credible. It makes you look good. It makes your brand look good. You don't want to take the approach of someone that's um, an influencer on TikTok and do something really informal when they're talking at the camera. That works well for them in that context. It's a more informal kind of a topic. Remember, you're not going to those influencers on TikTok necessarily as authority, so to speak, in their particular area. But thought leadership is about authority. So slicker production, better production, mapped out plan is better for you as well. And that allows you to work in things like numbers and uh, stock videos and things like that so that you can make your presentation all the more powerful and tell that story visually. That's the other thing to remember. A lot of times people fall back into the default of them looking at the camera and talking, but you really wanna be more of a narrator in certain points of the video and have other images tell the stories. That's gonna be a lot more powerful. So that pretty much covers it from, uh, from video standpoint. Of course, there's another way to have a dynamic approach with your thought leadership content like we're doing now, and that would be webinars. So it's kind of meta for us to be discussing webinars uh, while we're doing one, but let's go into it anyway. Uh, one of the first things you want to think about is finding a fit in terms of what you're doing with your webinar topic. In other words, cover something that makes sense um, that can fit a 30 minute to one hour presentation format for a webinar. And that's tricky, but you have to think about something and line it up properly and have it be the right topic. The other thing you want to think about with this is uh, making it uh, uh, narrowing it down. OK, because if you go with something that's too broad, then your webinar is going to be thin. So, for example, if you were to do a webinar on something like digital marketing, that covers a lot of ground. That's not going to be enough to do in an hour. Um, it's going to be, you know, so your, your, your webinar is going to be more superficial. But if you focus on an aspect of digital marketing, like hyper personalization, for example, that should give you enough material to cover a webinar. So you have to go into those specific areas. So remember that the, say, the saying in Spanish is el que mucho abarca poco aprieta. So you have to think that uh, when it comes to webinars as well. What other things can you do? Invite industry leaders. When you have someone that's a good industry leader that comes to your webinar, just by association, they make you look good. Dime con quien andas y te diré quien tú eres, right? As the other refrán goes. So that's very important. Um, and, and so having somebody good, also someone that can speak, is also very helpful. And, and by the way, our AMI folks are readily available if you need someone to help out with an event. So give us a call, let us know. The other thing you want to think about is rehearsing. Um, basically, you want you don't want to have slides where you're reading off the data, like you're doing a presentation in school or something like that. What you wanted to do is sort of internalize it and rehearse all the transition and the changes. We did our best to rehearse for this, and hopefully the presentation is more or less reasonable. So that's something that makes a big difference in terms of webinars. What else? Keep your slides uncluttered. 
keep your slides on cluttered and make it move. You're probably all watching the other one on the right. Make it move is about animation and video. So they were showing sort of a wave. So that gives us some dynamism as well. Find ways to work in uh, moving elements like videos and animation and stuff like that. And your slides should also be uncluttered. The one on the left there is fairly uncluttered and the ones you've seen in our presentation so far are pretty simple. And the reason for that is if you give people too much to look at in a webinar, it's gonna be a lot harder for them to sort of follow what's going on. All right. So now that we've covered that form of content with webinars, let's talk about marketing your thought leadership content and some of the steps you want to take in that sense. Well, uh, one of the basic ones is uh, original studies. The reason we say that is because when you're talking about thought leadership, if you can reveal new data and new understanding of your industry, of your customers, that automatically makes you a thought leadership and, and, and grabs people's attention. That also can lead to coverage. So if you think about it from the standpoint of watching news stories, how many times have you seen a news story about a new study that reveals this, that, or the other? So if you can, that's something that's extremely popular with the news media to cover. So if you can uh, put that in, if you can create an original study that they cover, then it's gonna get attention uh, for, for that particular story and other stories. Now. We have here social media and PR, right? They're gonna be uh, next to each other here. So wh what am I referring to with this? A lot of times what happens is the companies put together thought leadership content, but they never tell the people in social media or PR about what they're doing until the last minute. Then they go up to them and say, hey, look, I have something. Can you help me promote this? That's not really a good way to have a powerful promotion. It should be mapped out from the very beginning. Moreover, you wanna inv involve these departments in the creation of your content. Your social media people can tell you uh, what's being shared the most online, what formats are the most popular ones online. That can tell you then what kind of content you want to develop. You also can coordinate plans with them to break up your content. So if you do something that's a white paper that's full of data, you can coordinate a plan with the social media people to just to tease out parts of data one at a time, this figure, that figure. A post can be as simple as that, a bit of data that's shared. So think about that and coordinate some plans as far as that's concerned so you can get the most impact that you want to get out of, out of uh, your efforts with that. The same thing happens with PR. You want to talk to them because you want to know what topics journalists in your industry are covering and make your content about that so you can then maybe get some coverage and inspire them to cover. In addition, another format that's very popular that can be driven by data would be rankings. If you can create a study that's not necessarily you know, a, um, a bunch of data, but it's actually data that powers a ranking and you say the top 10 this, the top five that, that's something you can give to your PR department and they can run with that as well and get you coverage and basically get your content out there. Another strategy to think about with the PR department um, is also resources for journalists. They might be able to help you with this. A lot of times journalists just need resources. So you may develop content that's not about reaching the general public or people in your industry, but just for journalists, like a data pack. So that could be very effective. So that's something to think about as well. All right, so here are the don'ts. Let's go into things you should not do. There's a bigger list of don'ts than do's, I think, in this presentation, but I think that's important. So over here on the far right, I'm, I'm actually starting out of order. Uh, guest posts, uh, that's something where somebody comes to you and they want to give you some free content for your blog. That sounds great. The problem with that is that most of the time it's not an expert that's posting on your blog. It's somebody that's working for an SEO company. So the quality may not be very good. That's an issue. When you're a thought leader, you want to take care to, to ensure that your quality, uh, that, that your content always is of quality. So you don't want someone muddying that up with some random article. They also a lot of times have spammy links in their post because what they're doing is kind of shady sometimes with uh, the SEO. So you want to be careful with that and avoid it. Content syndication, this is very tempting. You pay a company money and they distribute your content all over the internet. There's a number of them to do it. A lot of times you'll see it where you're reading an article and you scroll down to the bottom and you'll see a section that says you may also like, and I have a bunch of different articles and photos and stuff. That's kind of what they do. The issue with that is that um, the results usually aren't that good. Go ahead and try and see if the trials work for you. I've tried it a number of times in the past. And what I find is that I get plenty of traffic, maybe a thousand people will visit my content in a day, but the visits last an average of 10 seconds. What that tells me is that it's, it's a bot traffic and it also tells me it's somebody that maybe made a mistake clicking. Either way, that's not who I want to look at my thought leadership content. I want people that are gonna spend two, five, 10, 20 minutes looking at my content, not those little short visits. So I want quality visits because that's gonna be what uh, is gonna give the, the power to my content and the effect. 
What else? Don't put out content without being able to measure it. That's true. You have to have a plan in place for that from the very beginning, because if you can't measure it, how can you tell whether it's helping you or not? Um, another thing that companies do when they make mistakes with thought leadership content is um, under promoting. They'll have an event, they'll send out one email, and they're kind of feeling shy, and they won't send out anything else. People are bombarded with messages. You have to follow up. By the same token, you don't want to go too crazy and over promote because people do that sometimes as well, and they send too many messages. You have to be careful with that, especially when we're talking about email marketing, because most of us that are in the B2B world don't have big lists. We're not like Estee Law there that has millions of people on their email marketing list. We're going to have maybe 5,000, 10,000 people or something like that. So those people, when you over message them, they drop off and you don't easily replace them. So you have to be careful with that and not go too crazy with it. Influencers, that's something that um, companies in, in the B2C side just love. I would say when it comes to um, B2B thought leadership, you wanna be careful in selecting influencers to make sure that they can actually deliver on what they say they can deliver. Do some tests to see if they actually produce the results. I would do that, of course, with influencers on the B2C side as well. You always wanna test them, but you know, just use that judiciously. The other thing I would say with the whole idea of influencers, why can't you make your subject matter experts at your companies influencers in their own right? Why can't you give them a platform and push them out? That could be a lot more interesting and work a lot more for you than relying on somebody else from the outside. So that's just something to think about. Uh, what else? The last two tips are more like technical. Uh, when you try to uh, put together content, you need what they call a content management system. So I like WordPress. It's the gold standard. You can try other ones, but just be careful because there's a lot of bad ones out there. And what you really want is one that's going to allow you to uh, basically uh, load content very quickly, update it very quickly, get in there and do what you need to do, and have some variety in terms of the, vis uh, the visual presentation. So WordPress is a good one. There are other ones. Just be careful that you pick the right one. If you pick WordPress, um, there's going to be a temptation to add a lot of fancy effects. These would be given through uh, what they call plugins, which are programs that you get that are usually free that you add to your WordPress uh, backend, and it allows uh, different effects to happen on, on your site. Be careful with that because if you have too many of them, they can really affect your site performance. We learned a lot of this stuff the hard way, so we wanted to share that. And uh, we're almost getting to the end of our don'ts. The final one is don't stop. Don't stop. A lot of times companies will start a content initiative like this, thought leadership, and they don't get the results that they want and they quit. And that's just like quitting a diet or quitting an exercise regimen. You're not going to get the results out of it. It's better to look at what failed and try to experiment with new things to see what's going to work. And that's basically how we built it at AMI and have seen other companies do it. A lot of trial and error. And that's what leads you to have success in this area. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground, so and, and it's been a lot of topics in a relatively short period of time, so it may be a little overwhelming. So I want to bring on Lindsay Lear so she can emphasize some of the key points again that we need to uh, focus on here, because it's actually not as crazy as, and complicated as we made it seem. A lot of times you can reduce it to fundamentals that will work for you, and that's what did work for us. So I want to bring Lindsay along to talk about that and some resources that can help you with your thought leadership content. Lindsay. Thanks, Abel. All right, so yes, we've covered a lot. Don't forget, all of these details are contained in the man PDF manual you'll be receiving. So if some of the details are fuzzy, don't worry about that. What I want to drill in right now are just the five key takeaways. You know, once you have the fundamentals down, the general principles, the rest of it will flow. So five key takeaways, right? The first one is to use subject matter experts. Uh, if we can see the that populated on the slide. There we go. So use subject matter experts. You, you want your content to be quality, in-depth, top level analysis that will create a, a culture of, of fans who want to read your content because you're solving their problems on a regular basis. Uh, content marketers, uh, copywriters, they don't have that industry expertise. So make sure that you're incorporating that voice in your process. Strategize before executing. You know, it may be tempting to rush to produce content, throw a blog up, uh, throw together a webinar, but you want to really take the time to think out beforehand what is my strategy? What are my outcomes? How does this connect to sales? How does this connect to other areas of my industry, of my business? What are the the pain points I'm trying to solve. Um, really be thoughtful about it um, instead of being in the rat race to put out content. 
building calls to action. Uh, talk to your sales team about what outcomes they would want from a thought leadership uh, program. What do you want your readers to do? What do you want your readers to know about your brand and the services or products you provide? Making sure that you're making that bridge really clear. Package and repurpose. Um, we, you know, I mentioned repurposing blog posts to create a white paper. The investment in creating uh, content is it's a high investment of time, resources and energy. So you want to uh, get the most juice out of that as possible. So there's nothing wrong with taking a content piece, repackaging it and repurposing it for a different format, a different channel, this different distribution. Um, so you're really getting the maximum benefit out of your content. And then the last thing, which tends to get forgotten when we're passionately focusing on the subject matter, we forget about SEO and we forget about distribution strategy. We've worked with clients who uh, this has happened. Uh, so much passion and vigor in the content creation, but they really weren't prepared or set up to get their content out. And you know that that's an unfortunate situation. So we wanna make sure that you're prepared to, to have that in place ahead of time, okay? And, you know, if you may be wondering, well, how do I do all of this? You know, there are different strategies. Some companies already have in-house all the resources they need. They maybe function as a mini publishing house and can put that content out proactively on a regular basis without too much need for outside support. Uh, that's not the case for everyone, however, and you may have some of the capabilities in-house, but you may need to, to depend on some external partners to help you do this successfully. So that's why, you know, at AMI, we, lo we love thought leadership and we love helping other companies do good thought leadership because when we do that, we're all together collaborating, helping our industries grow and evolve. So some of the capabilities we have in-house that we can help our partners with, uh, a, a vehicle to do original research in Latin America, that's our bread and butter. So we have all of those resources in place. Our industry practice leaders are some of the leading subject matter experts in their respective industries that are um, constantly learning, constantly adding new insight to the industry that you can leverage. Content development, you know, we have the writers, we have the designers, we have the editors, the translators, all of those uh, technical, uh, tactical components needed to produce content. Abel, I think, has demonstrated his marketing strategy acumen. Uh, his, his department has really honed and, and, and uh, defined how to conceptualize and execute successful marketing strategy. And finally, distribution platform. AMI is a known brand. We have a webinar almost every month. Many of you guys know us very well. So we have the vehicles needed to get your content out as well. So we're available. Uh, we want to help you. We want to be there to help cover any of these bases as necessary or simply just help you brainstorm and help you understand how to do this. So for as a thank you for attending our webinar, uh, we we want to offer everyone on the call a free 30 minute consultation, either with a bell, myself or other practice leaders who are relevant to you. Uh, you know, you can use this 30 minute call to ask us questions about what you learned today. We can brainstorm about particular challenges you're having. If you're just getting started, we can provide advice on how to do that. If you're more refined and sophisticated, we can help you tackle specific issues you're, you're dealing with. Whatever, you know, you want to talk about with us, we're here and we, we'd love to do that with you. So I'm going to launch a real quick uh, poll to make this as efficient as possible. Go ahead and take a moment to you know, fill this out. Do you want us to contact you? If you do, say yes, we'll contact you in the next few days to schedule that free consultation. If you think maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure, maybe later in the future, you can select that option. And if you're not interested, no worries, just let us know. You'll still receive the manual and you'll still receive a recording of this webinar for your reference. So I'll just leave that up for another couple seconds uh, here for to give everyone the chance to respond. And of course, once you receive that manual, you may have additional questions so you can always reach out in the future. Uh, this is by no means your only opportunity. Um, so it looks like almost everyone has, has made a selection. So thank you everyone very much uh, for being here, for your attention and participation. And we do have some questions. Uh, we understand we're at the top of the hour. So if you have to sign off, not a problem, but we'll, we'll stay on to answer uh, several questions that came through. All right. 
So let's take a look at some of the questions here and see what we have. Um, one of the basic ones is uh, th that I saw up there is one of the common ways to measure thought leadership, whether it's working or not. And that's kind of part of your strategy. What do you want to get out of it? When you figure out what you want to get out of it, then you can get into the measurement of it. So some companies are going to say, okay, well, what I want to get out of it is just, you know, greater brand awareness. So you can measure that with web traffic or something like that. And the response that you get from e-blast and things like that. So you can, you don't use Google analytics because you have perhaps a proprietary system. You can measure your web traffic before and after starting thought leadership, what's working the best. That's going to give you some uh, something. If you're trying to get lead generation going, there's different forms of thought leadership that you can set up to, to try to get leads. You can use uh, pieces of content where you can uh, get people's information that way and see if they're interested in, 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 uh, in doing business with you. There's other ways that you can build direct response and calls to action, and that will also let you know whether you're getting results. So a lot of it just depends on what result you're after, and you basically build that into your strategy from the very beginning and then execute from there to try to get um, at that. So uh, hopefully I answered that. Bella, a quick comment there too. Um, you know, an opportunity to engage your entire organization and your thought leadership ideas is engaging the sales team. And when it comes to tracking, uh, tracking the effectiveness of a thought leadership campaign, it's important to train your salespeople to ask, how did you learn about us? How did you get in touch with us? And, and specifically see if it came from an article, a white paper, a webinar, making sure that you're capturing that, you're able to track it, which is another, so, and you, another important component to measuring your thought leadership. And if you do that, you get your salespeople involved, they support the effort, that just creates more goodwill, more momentum in the industry to do a good job. Agreed. Uh, there's a questionnaire from Gustavo. Does a PR distribution platform make sense to distribute a white paper? I would say yes. Um, I would do a press release that's about the white paper, and then you link it back to wherever the white paper is going to live so people can find out about it. Because if you pick a good one, like PR Newswire or somebody like that, they blast it out across a bunch of different sites. So it'll end up in, in search engine rankings, and it, and it helps. It's, a, it's not you know, a be-all, end-all solution, but it's a good way to get it out there. So I would definitely look at one of those. And we've done that in the past, and it's worked for us. Um, so let's see. Email surveys that can serve as a marketing tool. That's a question that we have. I'm not a big a fan of that. I like email surveys just to find out what, um, what people are thinking. So I wouldn't want to promote that with content. I would do an e-blast with content of some kind, but I wouldn't do the surveys. I just don't like mixing, trying to find out information with promoting yourself. I'd rather give people information and promote the brand by something um, beneficial like that, rather than trying to ask them for stuff and then say, hey, by the way, you want to buy this. So I, I, I don't uh, favor that. Uh, Jaime is saying to us, uh, why do we not introduce podcasts or video casts and thought leadership? The reason for that is because podcasts usually have to live on a different platform and it's a lot harder to track the results. You can do it, but you have to really build things up over time to be able to get that podcast going. And it takes a while to build an audience for that. And there's a lot of competing podcasts. Also, uh, a podcast sort of lives as audio content as a file on the site. It's not necessarily something that search engine spiders pick up on so people can find it down the line. So if in our experience, we did look at doing podcasts, Jaime, but the thing is, it just seemed like it was a lot of work to maintain for results that were difficult to establish in the sense of being able to track to see what the benefit is. It may be helpful, uh, and certainly different companies can try that. For us, it's not as big of a thing. It doesn't mean you can't do it. Uh, what I would just say is play with the format as much as you possibly can so you can figure out how to measure the effects of it because you don't want to do it if you're, you don't know what the effects are going to be. You have to be able to track those effects. So that's what I would say in response to that. Abel, um, it looks in the same question, it looks like Jaime is also asking what's the most effective and efficient tool that we've used, that we've seen. Um, I can see oh, exactly. Yeah. Like, I think it, it really varies, you know, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, all the formats kind of have a different, you know, outcome. But, you know, I was for, for me, for us, for the payments practice, I, I, I have found white papers to be the best, um, the best vehicle, because, again, you can deliver a lot of information, especially data in a, in a visual format, a lot of charts that's very engaging. Uh, white papers you can print out, you can give as gifts. And you can, another strategy that's really great is you can use a white paper and then complement it with other formats. So you can have a webinar 
discussing the results of your white paper. You can invite clients or partners to be guest speakers to cover, uh, you know, to, to further distribute and generate in, uh, conversation and inquiry around the, around the, the subject matter. Um, you can also break it up into smaller pieces and have them as blogs. So again, it, it really, it really varies. John, what do you think about other industries? Yeah, I think, you know, white papers are really essential for laying the foundation of credibility around this, the subject or the trend or the issue that you want to dominate, that you want to be considered an expert on. After that, you can maintain yourself top of mind with articles and uh, webinars and videos and other things that are going to be uh, less effort to produce. Um, but you, but what the white paper does is it, it gives you that foundation of credibility around that subject. You may have a very strong brand, but not be necessarily a credible voice in a emerging area where you want to be. And that's what a white paper really affords you to do. The other thing about that is too, when you have a white paper that's that's packed with valuable information, whether it's data or um, you know other other things people are likely to go back to it over and over. Oh, what was that data point that, that AMI quoted? Let me go back to it. So they're constantly re-engaging with your brand, which is less likely to happen in a webinar or some other things that are more of like a in the moment type of experience. So we have clients come back to Lindsay, can you resend me that wet, that white paper? You know, I found this white, this wet, this white paper from 2018. I keep going back to it. That's another benefit. All right. Uh, let's see. We have another question here about repurposing content, which uh, how do you do it? And we uh, touched on that a little bit. But basically, if you start off with a piece of content that let's say it's a white paper, you can pull data out of that to create an infographic. You can summarize some of that data in a video. You can make a webinar that's driven by a lot of the findings in that white paper as well. And then you can break up the white paper and turn it into a series of blog posts. So that's sort of a, a simple way to do that. And so a lot of times when you map out your content, if you think about how you're going to repurpose it from the beginning, it makes it a lot easier to execute later on. Although once you have some experience with it, just like I did now, you're, you're going to be able to find those ways as well. It's just a, a matter of being a little bit more creative with that and looking for different ways to engage people. Uh, let's yeah, see. Abel, re repurposing can also mean updating, right? Um, let's say you, you produce a study, you have some data. A lot of times that data might have a shelf life of six months. Uh, so it may feel like you, like you have to be very fast all the time updating your information. But half the work of thought leadership is creating the story, the narrative, the platform, the actual distribution vehicle. You know, once you have that in place, you put a piece out, then you can go back to it six months later and say, hey, folks, we've updated this data. You already have an audience paying attention to that data. So repurposing can also mean slightly updating to continue that that engagement over time. Correct. Um, in terms of other questions, let's see if we have anything else. Here. I think we've caught um, we've, we've addressed the large majority of them. Um, the, another question here was about sending out an e-blast. Besides sending out an e-blast, it'll be sort of an e-newsletter. How else can you distribute thought leadership content? And so obviously, you know, webinar is a pretty straightforward formula. The press release that we had mentioned earlier using a PR, a press release con uh, content distribution platform can also work as well. Um, in addition, social media ends up being a great platform. You can do unpaid or paid. A lot of times uh, uh, you can do sponsored content on LinkedIn and things like that. So there's a variety of different things that you can do in that regard. You can also go further uh, and, and depending on what your budget is like, a lot of times companies go beyond SEO and they'll use Google ads basically to distribute nothing but a content piece. So it could be a webinar or something like that to drive traffic. That's more expensive without a doubt, but that also, if it, it works really well for general products. So there's no reason why it wouldn't work for something like content just to get the people to read your story. So there's a variety of different things. It's just a matter of just exploring what's gonna work and doing tests until you can get to the point where you know what's working for you based on the results. If I could just add to that, Abel, um, it may seem like a world uh, that we, uh, far from us right now, but there will become a time when we once again shake hands with people and meet them at conferences, um, invite them to round table discussions where we sit in the same room. I don't know if it's six months out or a year or when it might happen, but a white paper that's sort of handsomely printed becomes a very powerful um, 
uh, gift, if you like, that you hand out to people? And is that much more captivating when it's held in their hands? And if you accompany it, or if you combine it with a, a speaking engagement, a seminar where, you know, where you take that content or portions of that content, and you provide a seminar to a a select number of clients or potential clients. Uh, we've seen that very effectively used, particularly if you're selling in the B2B environment where those relationships are big ticket items, uh, which can often happen in payments, it can happen in logistics, uh, whereby you know if the, the, the benefits of adding an additional client uh, are huge, and therefore you can justify these costs of not just develop a white paper, but the offline distribution, which is obviously much costly, but much more emotionally impactful as well. Another idea there is to gain access to new new audiences, you know, not just using the technology that's available that, that Abel mentioned, but also, um, you know, each company has their their mailing list and their their target audience, right? But a lot of your partners in their audience are people who are maybe interesting to you as well. So something that's very successful, that's very useful is to have partnerships with your vendors, with your partners. Maybe you offer yourself as a guest speaker at a webinar that you wanna offer a webinar to their audience. So now you're getting in front of new people altogether. Um, and very often you can capture their contact information and join forces. You can invite your you can invite your clients or partners to come on to your platform and promote the event among their audience. So they bring with them their people. So combining efforts that way exposes you at a very low cost and you're actually adding value um, to, to a whole new set of, of audience members who may be adjacent to you, but, but still very interested in your company. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, I think that uh, we pretty much addressed all of the questions. So I think we're wrapped up for now. We're about 10 minutes over. Um, we, we, we were saying earlier, you can expect the recording of the webinar to be sent to you within about 24 to 48 hours. And also the Thought Leadership Manual, you can see the cover there. We're going to be sending that along to you maybe with a slightly different cover. And that's going to be addressing a lot of the points that we talked about here. So hopefully we've given you some food for thought and some tips that you can use. Uh, we'd certainly be happy to hear your feedback and hopefully uh, we can talk again in the future about content marketing, thought leadership and other forms of uh, marketing tactics. Thanks so much for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful day.